Hi. Welcome to today's session on designing effective assessments. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at Northern Illinois University. And I'm really, really very excited about today's topic. I'll take a moment and let those of you who are joining us live introduce yourselves in the text chat area. Just if you would, a little bit about yourself so that the others know who you are. Maybe your, your name, your department, and any thoughts you have on assessment. Your favorite part, your least favorite, uh, any concerns you have, and sp particularly concerns and questions so that I can try to highlight those during the session today. So I'm going to mute my microphone for just a moment and give you some time to type those in. All right, while you're doing that, I gave you a little bit of lead time to get started at least. So let me share a little bit more maybe about what I've, I hear quite often. I hear that um, from a faculty perspective, the least favorite part of assessing is usually the grading. Uh, that's always time consuming. We have a separate workshop on quick and painless grading that I would highly recommend if you're concerned about um, how much time it usually takes. I have some suggestions for how to speed up your grading and how to plan for quicker grading. Um, and then some of the concerns I often hear or questions are about knowing how you are actually assessing the right things. Is this the right approach? What will my students think of this approach? And those come from um, a variety of, of disciplines. New faculty, experienced faculty, everyone has those same concerns. Specifically, um, one participant said that she's new to teaching and simply wants to learn more. That's good. This will give you a nice, I think, um, base to work from. Uh, David is worried about being too strict. That's, it's a tough line to follow, and I, I do have a suggestion for, for that, as well as uh, the, the last comment here about how to make assessment fair to everyone. I think that that's a, again, it's a tricky, tricky line and fair is a, a difficult concept to approach. So we'll, we'll talk about ways that you can look at both of those when you are designing your assessments and when you are grading them. So thank you. I have two primary questions that I want to answer today. And I think these parallel some of the questions that you've posted for me. First, we'll look at some of what are good assessment practices. And I did put good in quotes. I, I hate when people do that arbitrarily. But today, I use those quotes because for every good assessment practice that I will tell you today, someone else will tell you that they have something better, something different. There are a lot of different approaches. And this is, um, I think, a, a fair and balanced approach to address what, what you had commented on before. And then the second question that I want to answer for you today is how do we know when, a, when an assessment is, again, quote unquote, good? There are some specific measures if you're a statistical person. If you aren't, there are just some good um, approaches to, to take and some good questions to ask yourself when you reflect on your assessments. So, my first one, looking at some good assessment practices, some best practices to recommend. I have sort of five principles that assessment should align with your course objectives. It should integrate with your learning activities, what you're actually having students do to learn. You should utilize both high and low levels of cognition in your assessment so that there's, there's some recognition for students who are at a lower level of understanding, but also an opportunity to both stretch to a higher level of understanding and to demonstrate a higher level of understanding. Uh, again, assessment should be reliable and fair. That came up in your, your concerns. And it should close, a, close the loop, which is what we 
tend to refer to it in the assessment world, close the loop and bring that assessment information back to inform your teaching practices. So I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail. Starting with, assessments should align with your course objectives. Hopefully by now, you're familiar with the term objectives. Usually we write objectives or learning outcomes, they're related, uh, to specifically delineate what it is that students need to know by the time they've completed the course, the unit, the lesson. You can get as, as small and focused, looking at what they should know from a particular day of instruction, as well as look at, for the whole course, what should they know by the end of the semester. And from there, that should align, theoretically, with what activities you're asking students to do. Those activities are how the students will learn, whether that's reading a textbook, listening to a lecture, uh, completing a simulation, or working on a case study, doing some group work. All of those are different strategies that you can use to help your students learn what you have already in the objectives identified that they should be able to do or know. And then your evaluation should align directly to those activities and back to your objectives. We usually, I at least, prefer to use what's called backward course design, where you'll start with your objective still and what students should be able to do by the time you're done. But before you look at your, your learning activities, your lesson plans, your weekly agendas, you actually want to go back and look first at what students will do to show you that they have learned that material. That lets you then design your course specifically to address those assessment techniques. In um, more of the K-12 setting with so much standardized tests, this sometimes gets a bad rap as being teaching to the test. But uh, here in, in higher ed, I think what it really means is if your assessment is a, uh, for example, maybe you have them complete some sort of a research project and that's your assessment, then somewhere in your learning activities you need to be preparing students for that type of an assessment. To me, this also means that if you are, this alignment means that if you're going to use more active teaching strategies, for example, maybe you're flipping the classroom or you're encouraging students to engage in more application, performance-based uh, activities in class, that your assessment should align to that as well. So I hate to see classes that are really vibrant uh, together where the students are discussing and problem solving uh, in class, but then they're assessed with a multiple choice exam those don't align, they don't match. So once you have your, your course plan sort of um, prepared, designed, it's a good idea to go back and look at all three. In fact, uh, we often in our workshops distribute what we call a three columns chart, and it's just a table with three columns that looks at objectives, learning activities, and evaluation so that you can see them all across on the road and make sure that they all align to one another. A few other examples that I want to work through with you on aligning your objectives and your assessments. Objectives, of course, have strong verbs, action verbs, on what students will be able to do. It's not that they understand something, it's that they'll be able to identify, list, recognize, describe, explain, create. Um, we use these, these stronger verbs to demonstrate exactly what students should be able to do or know with the information that, that we'll be teaching them. So when you're looking at your objectives, it's important to make sure that what the actual assessment is matches to that verb. So for example, if my objective, so something about recognizing or identifying specific uh, examples or specimens or um, be able to recognize principles, 
in action. Then it would be fair to give a multiple choice or a matching type of question. Just simply in the situation, can you identify a specific point? However, if my objective says that students should be able to describe something, that they should be able to describe a phenomenon, they should be able to describe an approach, a theory, um, then that requires more of an open-ended assessment because the student has to have the opportunity to actually do that describing. So that might be a short essay. It could be a simple, depending on how complex the concept is that they need to describe. It could be just a few sentences. It could be a longer essay. If you get into that an objective says that students should be able to explain something, then that probably requires an even longer uh, written work. It might be instead of an essay, this might also be a presentation. For example, if you need them to explain the, the impact of a historical event on a current, uh, a current issue in the news maybe, that might be a, an oral presentation as opposed to a written work, but that explain still takes more open-ended creation on the student's part. So just a few more examples. What would be the difference, and feel free to pop something into the text chat there. What would be the difference if you're in assessment, if your objective said define key terms versus your objective said use key terms? What type of an assessment might you use for define that would be different from use? I'll give a moment to see if anyone has any thoughts. All right, I can see those, there's that small blue icon, if you aren't familiar with Blackboard Collaborate, that little talk bubble that pops up means that someone is typing. So when I see that, I know to wait just a little bit longer to give you a chance to type. So Melanie says define would be a, a short answer, uh, whereas use would be a, some examples, definitely. David define could be a short answer, whereas use could be a fill in the blank. Fill in the blank would be a, an easy would be an easy way to grade it because they would have to specifically pick a, a term. Uh, that would be a lower level of cognition, and that's not bad. But the both of those could be using either giving an example, use this in a sentence, or um, even without going into asking for a specific term, it could just be an assessment of can students write about something in your field using the correct terms after you've introduced those. And Bill, yes, for define, uh, define can always be a, a multiple choice as well. If here's the, the term, which of these is the definition, um, absolutely. There are always different approaches. But you can see that there is a little bit of a different impact, whether you're asking students simply to be able to define something versus being able to use that in some uh, real world context, perhaps. I'll go through these a little bit quicker, but a few others that just to show the impact that that verb in your objective has. If your objective says that students will be able to list the events that led to World War I, to me that sounds like a short answer. Um, it might be a, a matching or an ordering. Put these events in the correct order. Whereas explaining the events is more of an open-ended dialogue. It might be verbal, it might be written, but it requires more more uh, synthesis of how those relate to one another and how they progressed, where simply listing would be a, a lower level uh, task. And then finally, here we have the same verb, but two slightly different objectives. So one is apply the theory of behaviorism to your own experience, or apply the theory of behaviorism to teaching. And this is a good example where our objectives sometimes are not specific enough or are specific to the wrong area. Um, applying the theory of behaviorism to your own experience is a backward 
uh, task. It's reflecting on something that's happened and how that might relate to a current theory. And it is a fantastic way to get students to internalize the information a little bit more. Applying what they're learning to themselves is a fantastic way to, to do that. The other option here, apply it to teaching, is more of a, a hypothetical, a theoretical exercise where if they haven't done that yet, they have not taught yet, they're trying to look forward and see how this new theory could relate to their future experience. So even though these are the same verb and they could be the same assignment, it could be write a paper that applies the theory of behaviorism to either your own experience or to teaching, depending on which your objective stated. It could be the same assessment, the same verb, but two different tasks that we ask students to do. And again, that would depend on which of these is your objective for which assignment you would ask students to do. The second principle is that assignments, assessments, should integrate with the actual learning activities you're having students do in class. So at this point, I want to stop and look at the two different types of assessment that we look at. Um, one is formative and one is the other is summative, summative. You've probably heard these terms thrown around a bit. They're not all that uncommon anymore. Essentially, formative means that it is during the instruction process and at a time when there could still be changes made, either to your teaching strategy or uh, to the, stu the student's learning. So this is more forward looking, looking at the, the continuation of the student learning and your teaching. So for example, homework is often a formative assessment because it's a chance for students to check their understanding and correct their understanding if there is an error. The same is true of perhaps writing a draft of a paper. If they write the draft and turn it in or give it to a peer for some feedback, that's a formative assessment that allows them to still make some changes. A midterm evaluation is also a great example. Uh, here at NIU, we have end of course evaluations for all of our courses. And at that point, it's too late for you to make changes for that semester. You can make changes the next time, but you can't help those particular students. So many faculty choose to do an informal or semi-formal midterm evaluation just for their own benefit to get some information on how the students are learning, how their approach is being received, while you could still potentially make some changes. Summative assessments, on the other hand, occur after instruction. This could be even during the middle of a semester, if it's the concluding assessment for a particular topic or, or unit. So for example, the, a unit exam or a chapter exam would be a summative assessment. It's really trying to evaluate the performance that has already occurred. So this could be um, a final presentation at the end of the semester or a, a demonstration of a particular skill. I always like to pick on Bill when he's in these sessions. Uh, a recital is a summative evaluation, a summative assessment of the student's performance and learning and growth. These are the most useful in terms of grading. This is how if we often final grades are based heavily on summative assessments, exams, presentations, midterm and final exams, uh, but they don't provide a great deal of feedback to the students. So realistically, a, a good assessment plan for your course would integrate both. Some formative that integrates with the learning activities and are, could actually be educative, meaning that students could learn by completing the assignments or having completed it but learn from their feedback. And you should have some summative that evaluates not only the student's learning process, but their final performance, their final state of knowledge of skill. This here I mentioned a moment ago, educative assessment. This is a, um, 
a model put forth by D. Fink, and I have a full citation for his book at the end of the presentation. Excuse me. And really, it's a a fantastic approach for creating assessment that is not only evaluative, it's not only about grading, but it's also about helping the students shape their learning. So educative assessment is forward looking. It often includes a component of self-assessment, whether that's a formal self-assessment, like when we ask students to grade themselves, or just a moment of reflection, of allowing students to reflect on their own work to self-assess their performance and any weaknesses or improvements they might need to make. Educative assessment includes criteria and standards, both so that students know what they are shooting for, what is the, the goal that is part of the educative, that they know they can learn what the standards are, what the expectations are, what a good performance is by virtue of completing these. And it includes a great deal of feedback. He uses the acronym FIDELITY, F-I-D-L, all stand for something. But the important part there to me is the feedback. The educative assessment has to have some sort of feedback to the student, whether that is from you, from an answer key, perhaps, if there's a homework set, or from their peers. There has to be some sort of feedback for students to learn from in order for an assessment to be educative and part of the learning process. The third principle, then, is that assessment should use both high and low levels of cognition. What do I mean? Hopefully you've heard of Bloom's Taxonomy. Anyone want to give me a, another check mark or just a yes in the text chat if you've heard of Bloom's Taxonomy before? All right, so a mix, most of you yes. Uh, for those of you who have not, um, Bloom's Taxonomy is essentially a model to demonstrate, to, to um, stratify the different types of thinking that we can ask students to do. Starting from low levels of cognition, remembering, simply can students recall something that we've told them, understanding, can the student explain the concepts back, applying, can they use that information in a new way, in a new context. Analyzing is can the student distinguish between different parts or different examples or uh, break it into pieces. Evaluating, can the student justify a position, justify a decision, and make a decision? Can they determine goodness, rightness, badness, um, fit, things like that? And creating, can the students create a new product using what they have learned? Uh, Bloom's taxonomy is a, a very common uh, taxonomy used when looking at levels of cognition. And for assessment, you don't have to assess every single level. Um, what you assess really depends a great deal on what the expectations are for the course that you are teaching. If the goal is for students to get a basic understanding of some facts that are essential in the field, that might be a primarily you would primarily assess maybe remembering and understanding with a few applying concepts, a few applying assessments. But as they move through their, their field of study, we want to push students to move farther up the taxonomy and to gain more critical thinking skills and deeper understanding, as well as more advanced skill and competency with the, the concepts and the theories that they're learning. Part of the of moving up the scale into synthesizing, evaluating, creating, analyzing, all, all of these terms sort of grouped together up at the top, at the higher levels of cognition, uh, uses authentic assessment. This is a, a, an example of a high impact practice we can use with our students that really does make a, a strong difference in what they learn and how well they, they learn it. Authentic assessment relies on a real world performance or at the very least 
a simulation of a real world performance. If we can't actually get students out to do something in the field, we get them as close as we can under lab conditions or controlled settings in order to give them the, the experience of something close to that real world performance. And generally, authentic assessments require that students be able to apply the facts, figures, and theories that they have learned. This is also generally considered to be a student-centered assessment technique because it is not focused on the knowledge, but focused on the student and their capabilities. So some examples, these are some of, you know, for example, an authentic assessment could be uh, student teaching. It's a clinical experience. They aren't actually in charge of a classroom, but it's the closest that we can get for them. But even before that, before they're in their student teaching, we might have students give a presentation in class or teach a mini lesson to their peers to, again, to replicate that experience in a controlled setting where there's a lower risk of failure. Lab experiments are another great authentic assessment, having students actually perform an experiment. And ideally, designing the experiment as well, not only following a lab procedure. Auditions uh, and interviews are common tasks that students will complete once they have graduated, when they're looking for employment. Um, so when we can do mock auditions or mock interviews to give them that experience that for one, assesses their professionalism and their, their capabilities as a member of the field and gets them close to that experience. Uh, brochure is on there. It looks out of place, I know. But again, an authentic assessment might be uh, in, the, in several health study courses where students might be learning about specific conditions or, or diseases creating a brochure about that disease for a particular population uh, is a great authentic assessment about not only researching it, but then communicating what they have learned in a way that's meaningful to someone else. So these are just examples. There are so many more out there that are also authentic assessments. Even just having students work from a case study is a, a type of authentic assessment where they have to work with a real world situation and apply the, again, the facts, theories, and procedures that they've learned in the classroom. Pardon me just a moment. I often hear concerns about higher level assessments in large classes because when students put in more work, they develop more complex artifacts, and that increases the complexity of grading them as well. So for faculty concerned about high-level assessment, I have a few strategies for large classes in particular. One great strategy is to divide the course, the students, into groups or teams. This is not only helpful because you have fewer things than to grade at the end, uh, which is certainly a benefit, but it also uh, impacts students' ability to collaborate together. Um, time and time again, surveys of employers for, for recent graduates say that one of the most important skills for students to have is the ability to work in teams and collaborate. So asking them to do so in your course is not only a great shortcut for you, but it's also teaching students a real-world skill that they'll need to have when they graduate. You can also take advantage of peer assessment. I wouldn't do this for every assessment or for high stakes assessment, but particularly for formative assessments, your students can reflect on one another's work and provide feedback to each other rather than having all of it funneled through you. Um, the act of peer assessing, actually completing that, is educative in itself for students because in order to be able to review their peers' work, they have to already have an understanding of what the criteria and standards are, what uh, is a correct performance or a correct answer. And going through the peer review process helps them to learn more about what those standards are and apply those in a new setting. I also recommend for large classes, when you can, limiting the scope 
of what you ask students to do. Instead of having students write a five-page paper, ask them to write a two-page paper. It might seem like you're making it easier, but being concise is a valuable skill as well. Also, if you have students do presentations, that's difficult in a very large class, but in teams doing a short presentation, you can make that uh, feasible. And also, not every assessment needs to be an open-ended one. So if you are writing an objective test with multiple choice uh, matching, et cetera, type questions, you can write higher level objective questions that ask them to essentially apply knowledge or evaluate a situation, but respond with a multiple choice. It's not quite as authentic as an open-ended assessment would be, but you can push students to higher levels of cognition with a, an objective test question, like a multiple choice question. The fourth principle is that assessment should be reliable and fair. I think this gets to both of the, the concerns earlier about being certainly fair, as one person said, and the other about being too strict. That's sort of, to me, that's related to fairness, of knowing what your expectation of students should be for the point that they are in their studies or in their course. And to that, also, I want to go back and the, the Bloom's taxonomy example, the, the pyramid, relates to that as well. Because if you can identify where students should be from on their objective, should they be able to remember something or should they be able to apply something, that will tell you as well if what level of strictness, so to speak, what level of rigor you should expect from them. The primary tool, though, for being fair and being reliable to make sure that all of your assessing across all of the students is consistent, that's usually the term I like to use instead of fair, it's not about fair, it's about consistency, um, is to use a rubric. Rubrics are, to me, the probably the most powerful tool that you can use for any sort of assessment, whether you are grading a paper, uh, looking at a piece of art, or grading a performance, a presentation, or a uh, an acting performance, a dance performance, if you have a rubric that establishes what the expectations are, what the components should be, and what level those should be at, then your evaluation can be consistent across all of the students and can provide more feedback than a score would on its own. So tool, the, the rubric as a tool can help you be precise and accurate in the judgments you make. And every act of assessment is essentially a judgment. Uh, they can also increase the consistency both in your, your judgment of the merit of the student as well as the score that they receive. For students, it will, both, it will tell them what will be assessed meaning it, it directs their attention to the most important components of the, the topic, the assignment, the task, and can let students know, inform them as to what a successful performance would look like. What do they need to be able to do and at what level do they need to be able to do that to be successful at this point in their, their career, their whether that's their, their professional career as a member of the field or simply their academic career as a student. This is an example of a very detailed rubric. Uh, just a few of the components at the, the left, each of those headers for the rows are the criteria. So this tells students that for this, this is a class discussion. Um, in this case, it would be an online discussion board uh, posting that this would be applying to. But students can know from here that they need to show knowledge of subject matter, evidence of doing some research, and use correct grammar, punctuation, and spelling. And then across the top, you have the different levels of performance. Here, they're given um, textual names, exemplary good, satisfactory, poor, unacceptable. Those would also align with specific scores, too. 
maybe that's five, four, three, two, one, or four through zero. Um, but this lets you identify, for example, if a student is presenting new ideas to make a practical application, but they don't bring forth new or expanded that reflect critical thinking. If they're showing the application, but they're not showing as much critical thinking, then you know to assign students to the good box. It also lets students know why they got four points instead of five on knowledge of the subject matter. And you can do that for each of these criteria. I think for you, the most important thing is to start by thinking of what your different um, criteria are. What are the different areas that you think are important about this assessment, about this task? And then identifying a few, you wouldn't have to be this detailed, but a few specific traits that distinguish an exemplary performance from an OK performance from an unacceptable performance that helps you be more consistent in your grading and it helps students be more focused in their, their responses, their performances. Uh, ideally for me, students should see a rubric before they actually complete the assessment. There are people who, who don't want to do that because they feel that this is too prescriptive, that then students will only shoot for a certain level or will only do the minimum. But um, I, I personally think that giving students as much information as possible just helps them to be more and more successful. You don't necessarily need to be this specific with a rubric. I would definitely list the criteria, what are the different areas that students need to demonstrate in this assessment. And I might make a few notes on what the specific uh, what a good performance might look like. You might not need to provide all of these levels of detail, good, satisfactory, poor, the full narrative, but at least what an exemplary performance might look like and what some of the most common mistakes might be to help students avoid those. The fifth principle then is that assessment should close the loop, should inform your teaching practice and students' learning practice. So when you're teaching a course, I think it's important to talk to students about using their results on one assessment to modify their learning practices or their behavior for the next time. So if this is chapter one's, the first exam, uh, having a discussion afterwards about what students did or did not do well with and how they might change that for the next time, what they might study differently or how they might study differently is beneficial to students so that even if it is a summative assessment on the subject matter, it's a formative assessment on their learning process. And then the second way that we close the loop with assessment results is modifying teaching practices. If you find after the first exam that students did OK on the multiple choice questions, but if you had a few essay questions that they really struggled with those, then maybe you can incorporate more of those types of thinking into your, your next few lessons. Or um, if you find, again, that students really struggled with a particular concept, you may need to modify your plan for the next few days or weeks and incorporate more review into your teaching so that students, if they've missed the, the critical concepts the first time around, can still learn those and improve their, uh, their scores the second time around because they'll have that basis of knowledge. This also applies by, from one semester to another. If you find that one semester there's a clear gap by the end, something that students missed, don't let that slide. The next time you teach, make some notes on that. And when you teach that course again, try to modify the way that you approach that topic or that concept to try to improve the, the teaching process so that students can hopefully uh, learn that more effectively. 
This is particularly true, by the way, I'm, I know I'm focusing mostly on, on student assessments, but this is particularly true if you ask students for feedback. If you give a midterm evaluation to give, allow students to give you some feedback on the, the course, please make sure that you do close the loop and that you use that in some way. Even if all you do is, is have a conversation with students after the evaluation has closed about what the results were and what you might change, and if you can't change something, why you can't change that. If you ask for feedback and then you don't make use of it, students will feel that you're wasting their time. So it's, assessment is a valuable tool to be able to inform your practice, help students inform their practice. But if you ask for feedback outside of that, please make sure you, you do something with it, you use it. So hopefully by now, I've answered that first question on what are some good assessment practices. That was not exhaustive, uh, but it is exhausting <laughs> for me to go through it. Uh, hopefully you've picked up something there. The next step now is to look at how we know that an assessment is good. Let me pause for just a moment. I'm not going to get into the, the theory of assessment um, verification or, or validation, but just a little bit of information on how, how we decide that an assessment is good or might need to be modified. So there are four key measures of a good assessment. Difficulty, discrimination, validity, and reliability. Uh, you do get, if you use a Scantron, a multiple choice exam uh, with Scantron through assessment services, I'm sorry, through testing services, they do give you this information back on your score key. If you use Blackboard for a, an objective exam through the testing feature, you can get the difficulty, the discrimination, and the um, and that's it, actually. You get a difficulty and a discrimination rating out of Blackboard. So you can get some information about each of your questions in particular as to how they rate. However, even though for those from testing services or from Blackboard, these are specific statistical measures, you can still use them from a more open-ended perspective just to reflect on your own assessments. So the first one, difficulty is a decision on how challenging the assessment is. Again, usually this is based on how well students perform. It's how difficult it was for the students after the assessment is over. However, you can assess this yourself going in. Before an assessment, it's important to ask yourself whether or not the challenge level is appropriate for what the students have learned and where they're at in their studies. So again, if you are thinking of Bloom's taxonomy and you've been focusing a lot on remembering and understanding and you suddenly throw in a, an evaluation question, that will be more challenging than what's appropriate for the student's current learning. After the fact, the difficulty is measured as the proportion of students who get the correct answer. So the higher the difficulty rating, actually, the easier the question is from a statistical, if you're looking at the statistics. But I would think of it, to start with, just from a reflective standpoint, is the difficulty level appropriate for your students? Reliability has to do with the consistency. So if students do, uh, if a student does well on the first assignment, do they also do well on the second and on the third? If there's a sudden dip or change, that might have to do with the reliability. In, um, from a statistical standpoint, this looks at um, sort of a test or retest measure to look at how students do overall. Discrimination is a more complex topic, and this one is usually only done from a statistical perspective. This isn't one that you would, you could reflect on actually a little bit, but it looks at whether or not the results are really telling you what the students are able to do. And usually, as a comparison, to see if the generally good students also did well on this assessment. 
So for example, from a reflective perspective in your courses, if you have a student who does really well all semester and then really just bombs the second, you're the third test, then that could be a discussion to have with that student. Or it might have something to do with the, uh, the, the way the test was written or was put together, what the task was that you asked them to do. On a multiple choice exam from a statistical perspective, discrimination is an index from negative one to one. And essentially what you want is a positive score. A negative score would mean that your good students got a question wrong, whereas the poor students got it right. And again, this comes from either testing services or from Blackboard. But you can also use it to reflect generally on your own assessments, um, either question by question or assessment by assessment. And then finally, validity is the hardest one to get at from an objective perspective. So we don't usually. Usually validity is a matter of, of reflection entirely. So this one I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Validity measures how true the results are. Essentially, if you're claiming to measure students' speaking ability, their, their ability to give an oral presentation, how valid is your assessment at measuring that? So, for example, if I, this comes back to alignment a little bit. If my objective says that students will be able to give a persuasive presentation and my object, my measurement of that is to have students write a persuasive paper, then my assessment is not a valid measure of my objective. Or if I want students to be able to uh, construct an argument, but my assessment is to have them read a paper and highlight all of the persuasive statements. Those are related, certainly. The ability to identify a persuasive statement is related to the ability to make a persuasive argument, but it's not exactly there. It doesn't quite align. And so validity is really three measures. The most common one we look at is content. That's what I've been describing. Does the assessment measure what it's supposed to measure, what we, what we claim, what we want it to measure? The criterion validity is our, looks at whether other indicators can also support our judgment. So for example, again, if you want, if my objective is that students should be able to construct an argument, my final assessment might be to have them write a paper or give a presentation in which they have to make an argument. But along the way, I might ask them to evaluate uh, and identify persuasive statements, evaluate the effectiveness of a particular persuasive argument, and then construct their own. And so if they're able to construct their own very well, and the other two scores also show that they're doing, making good progress, that's a criterion validity showing several indicators of the same outcome. And then construct validity is used more often in high stakes testing to look at whether or not their ability to do one thing predicts another. So for example, if I'm looking at whether or not students can construct an argument again, if their ability to, the students who can identify uh, persuasive arguments also are the ones who do a great job of constructing a persuasive argument, then I can say that in some cases, identifying an argument might be a valid way to assess being able to construct one because one can predict the other. So it's sort of a shortcut to assessing what you really want by looking at the traits that might predict it. And then I have finally, since we're talking about how to know that you have a good assessment, one of the largest problems is, is writing tests. And I'm going to close with just a few suggestions for that. If you use an objective test, again, uh, provide clear directions 
for precise questions that align to your objectives. For uh, an assessment aficionado, the best world would be one in which everyone wrote tables that aligned and made everything line up next to each other. But for in, in an imperfect world, <coughs> looking at your test questions and making sure that each one connects to one of your objectives is the best strategy to use. Other testing strategies would be to avoid lifting a phrase directly from your textbook. Uh, it's usually that it's a question then that is too narrow. Uh, you're going to assess a very small fact if you're doing this instead of a larger concept. And some of the, the terms that confuse students the most are when we use all, none, never, any of these extreme, extreme words, uh, particularly on things like true, false, where they have to make us a, a snap judgment based on one of these um, extreme words. And then for multiple choice questions particularly, you want to put the content, the most of the, the actual words in the stem, which is the prompt, and keep the individual choices as short as possible. That makes them easier to answer, not because it's easier to answer a question in general, but it, it reduces the load that actually understanding the question puts on them and allows students to focus more on the content. For you, it's easier to write the correct answer before you write the incorrect answers, the distractors. That will let you focus on what the correct answer is and write the others by contrast. When you write a test um, and you're writing those incorrect answers, Sometimes it's tempting to make a joke or to uh, make something that's obviously wrong because we can't come up with another one. But when you can, it's better to keep all of those plausible and when possible, base them on common mistakes or misconceptions your students have. Uh, I was a math teacher at one point and so when I had to write, I tried to avoid writing multiple choice questions for math. But when I had to do it, I would base my incorrect answers on a mistake, like losing a negative sign or doing something in the wrong order, so that a student might come up with that wrong answer themselves. And then finally, I argued earlier, I said that even with an objective exam, that you can, with multiple choice questions, you can push students to a, a higher level of thinking. So I wanted to demonstrate here with a few examples of multiple choice question types you can use that might ask students to do something a little bit more involved than just uh, remembering a fact. Whether that's, uh, I like the premise where if you have a circumstance, here's a situation, what would be the, the correct solution or the outcome of this situation? If I did this, what would happen? Um, a case study can be done via multiple choice just as well as it can be done, well maybe not just as well, but just like it can be done with a, an open-ended response. If you give students a situation that's a longer case, then you can ask several follow-up questions all based on that one circumstance. And then I also like the problem or solution where students have to evaluate a proposed solution. If you suggest that in this circumstance, the then student, you know, the in this circumstance, this was the action. You can ask students to identify whether that was a correct action or an incorrect action, and provide some distractors for why. Um, so these are examples of those more advanced, higher level, cognitively speaking, uh, types of questions you can ask. They don't have to just be. Uh, a, a simple recall of information. So that was a lot to go over. We covered a lot of stuff. There are some additional resources I'd like to share with you. Um, we have a section of our instructional guide on evaluating student learning. DeFink's book, Creating Significant Learning Experiences, is a great textbook to work from for improving your, your teaching in general uh, and specifically assessment practices. And then the um, 
Mueller here, Authentic Assessment Toolbox, has some great resources for designing specifically authentic assessments and what those might look like in your classroom. With that, if you have, I want to thank you for your participation today or for watching the archive. If you have any questions, my information's here on the screen, and I would certainly um, welcome you to send me those via, via email or connect with me on Twitter, I suppose. But again, thank you all so much for joining me today.